Yes. Good morning, family. <laughs> Good morning, Reverend John. I was smiling when Sandy said, uh, sadly, because uh, I thought, well, then I must need uh, some spiritual Botox for sagging spirits. And so my encouragement is titled, Practicing the Presence, Spiritual Botox for Sagging Spirits. And welcome to those who are joining us online, those in the sanctuary, and those who will watch the recording later. I hope that this, I don't only hope, I know that this encouragement will raise you up in consciousness to a greater understanding of the glory and greatness of that which proclaims its life, its love, its beauty, its truth, its order, and its joy through you, its beloved creation. Now, many of you know that I have, I have recently changed residences and I downsized, um, which means that one has to shrink 50 or 60 years of accumulated stuff uh, housed in a three or four bedroom townhouse into a two bedroom apartment. It's quite a liberating and interesting and heart-rending um, exercise and I did it with great joy because I know that my feet are kept on the perfect path by that presence and power which walks through eternity with me but in the middle of, of you know do I keep this do I toss it I haven't seen this for for 10 or 15 years it's go it's got to go um, I got a whatsapp call from a very good friend who lives abroad and he looked quite wonderful on, on, on the video, you know. And he said, notice anything different? And I said, no, but you look very well. I, he said, ah, my friend, I've had some work done. I said, well, I'm doing some work too. He said, oh, really? The same thing, Botox? I said, no, no, no. I am downsizing. He said, well, I am lifting my spirits, and in lifting my spirits, I'm also lifting my face. <laughs> you must have some done, my dear boy. All the fine lines around my, my, you know, my mouth and the crow's feet of my eyes have disappeared. And then he said the reason he was calling was he wanted my advice about coming home to Jamaica when he retires. And I thought to myself, well, sounds like you not only need to come home, but you need to also get, have some spiritual Botox <laughs> um, and if you come home then come to the temple of light because we have the answer you know and it's it's more than just a weekly injection it's a way of life that we teach people of how to lift your spirits to lift your recognition of the truth of your being so my friend anybody here this morning or who is listening online or who will listen later if you feel like you could use a faith lift, uh, a revitalization and a, strengthen of your, a strengthening of your belief, this is an open invitation from our hearts to you to join us on a regular basis at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. You know, the agonized cry of the father of the epileptic boy in Mark 9, verse 24, quote, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief what a cry have you ever felt that in your heart you know i believe a lot of us we really believe and sometimes we believe that other people have more of it than we do so we pray and we we learn to do spiritual mind treatment which is the scientific prayer that we use in this teaching we learn the the steps of treatment and we use them believing that this is this really works but then we something says you know you better ask so and so to pray for you because they have a stronger consciousness so notice you believe but you also believe that other people are ahead of you or have a deeper understanding or a closer walk a close connection with the living spirit almighty not nagosa all of us have equal access to the omnipotence to the omniscience and to the omnipresence that created us out of itself in the image and likeness of its eternity and said, I love you and I will never leave you. So friends, we believe in the power of belief 
but find it difficult to believe in our own power. We believe in the power of belief, but find it difficult to hold and to grasp and to stand up and proclaim, I am part of that unstoppable power that created all things out of itself. And me and God run things. Things not run we. So my friends, I guess I want to share with you this morning that this, this spiritual Botox, this understanding of your own divinity and your own greatness and the power that is at your disposal will really lift your spirits. It will eradicate those fine lines that are uh, showing up in your relationships. It will move the frown, remove the frown lines from between your eyebrows that make every little thing annoy you and get to you. It will make the crooked places straight and the rough places plain. Mm. Not just on your face, but on the face of your life's experience. The beautiful Jesus himself gave us the answer when he said, when you pray, believe you receive and you shall receive, unquote. Interestingly, you know, the Greek word for receive is in the past tense. So we, we should really be saying, or it should really be translated as, believe you received. It's in the past tense. So that when you pray, the gift has already been given. And all of us know people who seem to possess this faith. And we look at them and we say, boy, I wish I had some of that. And I often say to friends, you know, I don't know how many times God has to hold you down and gag you to prove to you how wonderful God is in your life. But I have to tell you a little personal story, you know, on this move from my old residence, my former residence, to my new wonderful garden apartment. As part of my exercise of letting go, I sat down with, with uh, a new journal, since it was a new move, given to me by my lifelong friend and life coach, Marguerite Rain, and I said, what are you going to miss about Devon Square? And as I said so, I heard the woodpecker on the light post, the old, you remember those old wooden light posts? There's one outside my Devon Square home. And every morning there's a rat a tat a tat a tat a of a woody, a beautiful wood, woodpecker. And I said, I'm going to miss the rat a tat tat of Woody the woodpecker. Now, friends, as I stand here speaking to you this morning, on my first morning in my new apartment, on a tree outside my front door, I heard the rat a tat tat of a woodpecker. I thought, wow, God, you are truly amazing in my life. The other thing that I wrote in my, in my journal that I was going to miss was the sound of falling water because in my garden I have a, a, a fish pond and there's a sound of water. If you listen to quiet moments in the garden, you would hear it as background uh, in, in, during my broadcast. And my first quiet moment in my new garden, my next door neighbor has a tiny fountain and at six o'clock on the dot, she put it on and there was the sound of falling water. How often does God have to say, let go now and just trust me? <laughs> you say you believe. Well, believe. And act as though you believe. Isn't that just amazing? Yeah. That I have the sound of running water where I live. I'm going to arrange a, a bigger pond, but that, that'll come. But in the meantime, <laughs> I, I still have the reassurance that life is flowing for me wherever I move and whatever I am doing. Walter Stark, author of a book titled It's All God, contends, my friends, that faith is not something one has, 
It is something one does. It is not a noun, it's a verb. So he says that faith has to be an act of conviction to be legitimately called faith. Quote, thinking is static, but faith is active. Those who believe they have faith, but do not do the things they have faith in, fail because there is no such thing as having faith in anything. He explains that things are results. Having faith in something, even in a religion, he says, is putting faith in results rather than in the cause. That's an interesting thought, eh? We need to look at the cause, the first cause, which is God. So to have the faith of God, we go to first cause. As students of science of mind, we have all been exposed to the teaching that our, our thoughts and our faith does create our experience. And we actually create our experience by having faith and then living from that faith. Well, we all have faith in many, many things. But do we have faith in the first cause? You know, some of us even have faith in negatives. I think I have shared with you um, the story before of, of this woman that I know who told me that every woman in her family had uh, breast cancer, and she was just waiting to hear when hers would show up. That's deep faith, eh? <laughs> and I said to her, I was just beginning to study um, to be a practitioner, and I said to her, what do you really want? And she said, I want to know God. I want to know God. And you know, they call me, if some friends call me irreverent John, because I said to her, you don't have to go across there to, to know him, you know. You don't have to make the transition to know God. Because you can know God right here in the flesh. And I give her uh, affirmation to say, in my flesh, I see God. Let us say that together. Today in my flesh, I see God. Together? Today in my flesh, I see God. In a half voice. Today in my flesh, I see God. In a whisper. Today in my flesh, I see God. Say it in your heart and feel it. I see God. And I know God, my friends. My dear friend Howard Daly, many of you remember him, the late Howard Daly, who was one of our musicians. As I held his hand shortly before his transition, and my eyes were brimming with tears, he said, John, don't, don't grieve, don't cry. I know God. Wow. What a powerful statement to make. I know God. And you know, friends, you may say, is it possible? Is it really possible to know God? Although the scripture tells us, be still and know that I am God. Or sometimes I say, be still and know that I am God. And to the, to the Middle Easterner and the Near Easterner, Roka Eriko, the Aramaic scholar who studied the language that Jesus spoke, said that knowing to the Near Easterner was more than just intellectual knowledge. Knowing had to do with experiencing something. And remember, Genesis tells us that Adam knew Eve. So knowing also had a, a connotation of intimacy which for me means into me see. So when I say I know you, or you say you know me, what you are saying is I see into you. I see the beauty. I see the life. I see the authenticity. I see the joy. I see it and I feel it because I know you. So knowing God, really has to do with having an 
intimate relationship with the source of your being. Wow. Can we begin to practice knowing God so that in our flesh, in our deepest part of our being, we have this firm assurance that the omnipotence, the power that is in all, through all, over all, and all in all is right where we are within us. Can we be assured that the omniscience, the wisdom that has the answer for every single question that we have about life, that that omniscience also dwells within us, and that the omnipresence of the infinite invisible walks through life with each and every one of us saying, be still, be still and know that I am God. What an assurance to have. What a, a, an affirmation to walk with, my friends. The certainty that divine mind is the vital energy that sustains your spirit, soul, and body. Let us say that together. Divine mind is the energy that sustains my spirit, soul, and body. Can we say that? Divine, divine mind, mind is, is the, the energy, energy that, that sustains, sustains my spirit, spirit soul, and, and body. body. Writer Paul R. Van Gordon tells a lovely story of a passenger ship caught in a violent storm while sailing from England to New York. The ship tossed and, and, and rolled violently so that it awakened everybody on board, including the captain's eight-year-old daughter. And so she jumped out of her sleep and said to her mom, if the frightened child said, what's the matter? What, what, what's up? And her mother explained about the storm. And the child said, is daddy on the bridge? And the mother assured her that he was. And the little girl pulled the covers back over, up over her head, snuggled down, and went back fast asleep. Because you see, she knew, she was sure, she had the faith that the father, her father, was at the helm of the ship. And therefore, there was nothing to fear. So my friends, this morning, no matter how stormy your life may seem, no matter how stormy the world about us and the reports of all kinds of happenings in the world, just leave us saying, where can we run? Where can we go? God, I need something to raise me up. I need something to lift my spirits. I need a faith lift. Let us remember that we have at our disposal the power that runs things. We have at our disposal the omniscience that knows everything. And we have with us on this journey, my friend Susan Goff used to always say, God is the journey and God is the destination. And so on this journey, we have the omnipresence. We can never be separated from it. So just stop and let that sense of godness in your life just sink deep into your DNA. There is nothing, my friends, but God. And when you have the faith of God, then you know that with the Master, you too can say, as he did to the storm, peace be still. Say it to the storms of your life. Say it to the wars that are happening all over the world. Say it to the families of little children cut down in, the, in, their, in their youth. Say it to people who have forgotten the truth of who and whose they are. God can raise you up. And God will raise you up if you will but have the faith of a little child who knows that her father is at the helm of the ship. And so this brings me to your assignment, your mission, should you decide to undertake it. 
and it is to keep your awareness this week of the indwelling presence alive, to practice the presence. Not just once a week when you join us on a Sunday or on a Tuesday evening or at a Thursday prayer power or at a Monday, Wednesday or Friday quiet moment in the garden, but every moment of every day, remind yourself that God is there with you. Recognize it, see it in the blush of a ripening mango and the taste of its sweetness, hear it in the laughter of children and the cry of newborn babies. See it in the faces of people passing you on the street. Just look for God everywhere. Practice the presence that is with you in your life and in your affairs. And be especially mindful of that presence in the people around you. You know, I say every Tuesday when I go to Tower Street to the, the prison, it is my practice period to look into the faces of men who have forgotten or who have never been told the truth of their divine origin and say, this is my brother. And they would say, what happened, Godfather? And I'd say, all is well, Godson. Because that is the truth. And many of them are kind of startled when you say to them, you know, you are Godson. Me? Say you. Because you are not what you have done. You are not the mistakes that have been made. You are God's son. And this is something that, that we need to practice. Ladies, if you don't like lizards, try seeing God in the little thick creature catching flies and mosquitoes <laughs> on the wall. Yeah, and I hear people saying, oh, tall order. Remind yourself that the intelligence that is used by every single created thing is right where you are. And that when you deal with people, no matter whether they are doing what you don't admire or they don't look like how you think they should look or don't behave like how you think they should behave, it is God's son or God's daughter looking for that closer walk, looking for that connection which is the yearning at the center of every living human being's heart. It is what we have come. I want to just end by sharing a, a, an essay by eight-year-old Danny Dutton from Chula Vista, California, who proved that he certainly knew God. It was a third grade homework assignment to explain God, and this is what Danny Dutton wrote. Quote, one of God's main jobs is making people. <laughs> he makes them to replace the ones that die. So there will be enough people to take care of things on earth. I love it. He doesn't make grown-ups, just babies. I think because they are smaller and easier to make. <laughs> that way, he doesn't have to take up his valuable time teaching them to talk and walk. He can just leave that up to mothers and fathers, and I would like to say grandmothers and grandfathers. <laughs> God's second most important job, said Danny, is listening to prayers. An awful lot of this goes on, since people, like preachers and things, pray all the time, not just on Sundays. God doesn't have time to listen to the radio or TV because of this. And because he hears ev everything, there must be a terrible lot of noise in his ears, unless he has thought of a way to turn it off. God sees everything and hears everything and is everywhere, which keeps him pretty busy. So you shouldn't go wasting his time by going over your, your mom and dad's head and asking for something they've already said, no, you can't have. And I love this. Atheists are people who don't believe in God. But I don't think any of them are in Chula Vista. Or at least, there aren't any in this church. I, to that, Danny, I say, amen. Yeah. Gosh, if we could just have the faith that children evidence, eh? The certain knowing, you know, th there's no question in their minds when they want something, it must be provided because they want it. Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this great teaching called The Science of Mind, said, and I quote, a realization of the presence of God 
is the secret power of our work. The realization of the presence of God is the secret power of our work. And this, my friends, is the spiritual Botox. This is that which will smooth out the lines, those carved deep in our faces by grief and worry, blame, shame, and regret. And the fine lines that threaten to mar the world that we live in. And that if we don't take care of, will soon become deep chasms which really mar the existence of the good life, the life more abundant that we were meant to live. And so, as the psalmist expresses it, just know that that presence and power that is in all and through all and over all can never be separated from you and you can never be separated from it. As he said, and I quote, whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. I love the image of the right hand just anchoring me in the peace and the certain assurance that God is at hand. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, said the psalmist, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the night and the light are both alike to thee. So friends, make practicing the presence your spiritual Botox. And as our beloved founding minister used to say, this ends the lesson and now begins the practice. Namaste. Thank you so much, Dr. John. Botox for sagging spirits, not faces. Botox for sagging. And in the talk, Reverend John reminded us that he's talking about a faith, a faith lip, not a face lip. Uh, there wasn't a lisp tongue there. It's, it's faith, not face. Um, the encouragement reminded us that we all have access to God. It reminds us that you are divine, that you have the power of God within. And then there's Jesus' reminder of the simple way of getting our prayers answered. When you pray, believe that you already have received the gift. In the past tense, you have already received it. And that will cause you to receive it in the future. You remember, of course, that there's no time with God. So you believe that you have already received it because it is the Father's good, what is the power to, to pleasure, pleasure. No, there is a P to give you the kingdom.